Dragons, devils, beasts and lambs. Funny images, but they teach us about realities of our world. Thanks for joining us today. I'm sad you can't join us in person, but I'm thrilled that you can join us for this episode in the book of Revelation. I'm Jeff Goodson. We're St. Stephen's Church, 2021. Yes, it's the year of gentleness. I read from Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven crowns. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who is about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. This is God's word to us today. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would give us strength to wait patiently, to be faithful, to be strong and steadfast, not taken in by the beasts of power and rule, nor swayed by every false teaching, but instead looking forward to the day when your victory is seen. Keep us singing in this world because you have redeemed us by your blood and you have marked us as yours forever. Amen. Late last year, Fishuk was visited by dragons. Don't believe me? We'll take a look at some of these images that were posted on Facebook by Maria Wagner. This is the, the rare blue sea dragon, known scientifically as Glaucus Atlanticus. And on the 16th of November last year, about 20 of them washed up on Fishhook Beach. Now it's Something of a mystery to experts that pretty much every society in the world has stories of dragons. Lots of theories have been postulated for that phenomenon. Perhaps these dragons are a distant memory of a time when, when dinosaurs walked the earth. Now, in our common understanding, dragons, well, they're seldom friendly. They're almost never like the, the cute and, and cuddly night fury dragon named Toothless in the, the delightful animated movies How to Train Your Dragon. Instead, dragons are, are fearsome. They, they winged creatures, horned serpents who, who breathe fire and leave behind them a trail of destruction. And today, we watch the dragon. But before we get there, Let's remind ourselves of what we're doing. Tracy, that's my wife's dad, has taught me over the years that there are three parts to any good holiday. 
There is the anticipation phase where you plan it, you book it, you read up all about it, you, you dream of those days and those nights. And, and, and then secondly, there's the holiday itself, which is, as you know, usually over far too quickly. And then the third part of the holiday is the memories, which you keep alive with the photos. You post them on Facebook and you post them on Instagram and you make your favorites a, a screen saver on your phone and you insist on showing your friends and your families your, your toenails as you posed at your particular destination. So we're back in the book of Revelation. And Revelation is a lot like that set of photos. So we're being shown photos of the world that we live in, photos of world history. Some of it's in the future, some in the past. The book is, is giving us different pictures from different camera angles so that we get something of an understanding of why our experience of this world is as it is. Now we turn today to a picture that contains dragons and beasts and the number 666. And, and using these images, the Bible is going to teach us about our world and help us to answer the question that our hearts keep asking. Why, why is it all such a mess? Why doesn't God fix it? Why is it so hard to be a Christian? Why is life not like our hearts want it to be? What does the future hold? And of course, how is it all going to turn out? So come with me today to our photo album. We pick up the story in Revelation 12 today, where we're shown right up front a woman. And she's beautiful. She's a, a beautiful woman, more beautiful than you can possibly imagine. And chapter 12 verse 1 says this. It says, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of of 12 stars. And this woman is, is pregnant, she's heavily pregnant, about to give birth, when the picture is dramatically interrupted in verse 3 by a horrible, hideous red dragon. Verse 3 says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, see, look, a, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his heads seven diadems. Those are crowns and his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and, and cast them to the earth. And, and the dragon stood before the woman who was, was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. It's horrible. Seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns, a powerful tail that sweeps a third of the stars out of the sky and, and he flings them onto the earth. The, the dragon is, is, is completely the opposite of the woman. She's beautiful. He's horrible and he's hungry. The dragon stands in front of the woman ready to devour her child that's about to be born. I'm told that an impala foal can, can stand within one hour of it being born and, and it can run within one day because you'll know that predators prowl around ready to devour the newborn foal. These foals are, are kept in little herds protected by their mothers because it's, it's so much harder for a predator to identify a single animal to kill it when they're in these little groups and, and, and just like a cheetah or a lion or a hyena watching the birth of an impala, hoping for an easy meal, the dragon is waiting to devour the beautiful woman's male child. But as the birth takes place, verse 5, that uh, child is, is snatched up to God, to his throne, and, and the woman flees into the wilderness where she's nourished for 1,260 days. Almost immediately, war breaks out in heaven. Verse 7 says, War arose in heaven. Michael and his angels were fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels, well, they fought back. But he was defeated. And, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was, was thrown down. That ancient serpent who's called the devil and, and Satan, the, the deceiver of the whole world, he, he was thrown down to the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. The dragon is identified for us in the passage. Did you see it? 
He's identified for us as, as Satan and, and there's war between the angels of heaven and, and Satan's forces. But the, the battle is short-lived. It's, 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 it's only brief and the dragon and his cohorts are defeated and, and they're hurled down to the earth. As a result, he's, he's very angry and he pursues the woman and, and her offspring, hoping to devour and destroy them. Take a look at verse 13 through to 17. And when the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to the earth, he, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was, was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and, and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to, to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Verse 17, then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now, in this picture, we are taken behind the scenes of the universe and, and we're shown a, a cosmic reality that seems a million miles away from our sophisticated, scientific, physical world. You see, the Bible teaches us a, that there is a reality that we don't see or feel, and that reality involves God and Satan. And we find it very hard to believe in the devil. And if we do, we think about the devil in the categories of hot stuff, the cute guy in the cartoons with his nappy on and his little smile, who's mischievous but, but actually harmless. Revelation, however, teaches us that behind our world is a cosmic battle between the dragon and the heavenly powers. It's a battle of good and evil. It's the battle over, over you and me. And the, the stunning woman we're shown dressed in the sun is, is the people of God. It's the church. It's, it's people that love God. It is, well, it's us if you're Christian, which is a great surprise to us because the people of God seldom look very beautiful and are almost always dysfunctional. We're so full of strife and division and pettiness and hatred. But, but when God sees his people, he sees beauty. And out of the people of God, a, a male child is born that will rule in eternity. This male child is obviously Jesus. And, and, he's, and he's born, as he's born, of course, the devil seeks to destroy him. But he fails and, and the child is snatched up into heaven. The life, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus is all squashed into that instant and, and we know that the dragon is defeated as Jesus goes to the cross. Satan is, is thrown to the earth. He's, he's furious at his defeat and, and he pledges to make war on the people of God in his final moments, his final hours. You see, at the core of the universe is a cosmic battle. Or, or perhaps I should say it like this. There was a cosmic battle. The, the Bible describes the battle between good and evil not as the battle of yin and yang. Our world is not one where equally strong good and evil forces are arrayed against each other. We're not taught that. We're not taught that we need to keep the opposing equal forces of evil and good in balance. Much of Eastern philosophy is built on, on the notion that sickness and suffering in our world, well, they come about as a result of this imbalance of good and evil in your life. And so the doctor or, you, or the medic must somehow balance those forces in your life in order for your health to return. No, 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 we're not taught that. On the contrary, the Bible teaches us that there is a real clash between good and evil. But the forces are not equal. And actually, the battle is over. It's been won in an instant. The Messiah defeats Satan, who now thrashes around seeking to destroy the people of God. So visualize a fisherman. I, I'm not a fisherman, but imagine one day you are uh, sitting out in your boat in False Bay with your, with your new rod. And, and, and it's, it's really exciting because the fish are biting. And today you, you, you're having increased excitement because you hook a marlin. 
Now, I know you can't hook a marlin in false bay. I'm not that hopeless a fisherman. But just pretend with me for a moment. And, and after a long battle, you land this great fish on the boat with, with tremendous excitement. And, and you hold it up and you take selfies and you, and you can see the photo mounted above your fireplace. And there's the fish lying in the boat, thoroughly defeated, but it's not dead yet. If you, if you leave it for long enough, it'll die. That's guaranteed. But, but it's still thrashing around a little bit in the boat. And, and if you get too near it, it may still bite you. It can still hurt you. But it's defeated. Thoroughly defeated. That is Satan. Defeated. And his defeat continues today. We conquer him, verse 11, by the blood of the Lamb and by the, the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. When you choose kindness instead of retribution, you stand on Satan's head. When you choose gentleness with your spouse in the face of constant provocation that makes you angry, you stand on Satan's head. When you get up on a cold and dreary winter's morning and you, you pray for your aged parents, you, you, you land a blow to Satan's kingdom. When you read the Bible to your kids, Though they are fractious and grumpy and breathe fire like dragons, you confirm the destruction of Satan. When you choose not to love your own life, but instead to, choose, to painfully love someone weaker than yourself, you conquer Satan. When you falteringly and ina inadequately and with much anxiety invite a colleague from work to church, you trample on the kingdom of the dragon who is, verse 17, furious at your actions and lashes out at you, making war. Now, now take a look quickly at how, how Satan makes war on the people of God. Take a look at what this defeated, thrashing fish looks like in our world. He, he, he uses beasts to draw people away from God. Chapter 13, verse 1 to 8 says this, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with, with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And, and the beast that I saw was, well, it was like a leopard. And its feet were like a bear's and its, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And, and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and his great authority. And, and one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but it's... Its, its mortal wound was healed and, and the whole earth marveled as they, as they followed the beast. And, and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And, and they, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who's like the beast and, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise some authority, authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make a war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and, and people and language and nation and, and, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So the dragon has two beasts who do his bidding. The first one rises out of the sea and, and that looks like a leopard. And it's got horns on its heads and crowns on its horns and it's covered in blasphemous names and it has enormous bear-like feet and a mouth like a lion and Satan has given his power and his authority to this beast and so people marvel at it. They marvel at it and they worship it. And this beast makes war on the people of God. And then we're shown another beast in in chapter 13, verse 11, who, who rises up out of the earth and, 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 and this second beast looks, well, looks gentle. It's only got two little horns, like a lamb, until it opens its mouth. And, and when it does that, it speaks like a dragon too. It's also got power and it performs great signs in order to make people worship the first beast. 
It even manages, verse 14, to, to make an image and then breathes life into that image. And so it seems to have power. And then it causes both small and great, rich and poor to be, to be marked with the mark of the beast so that they, they cannot buy or sell unless they have this name upon them or the number of his name. The number is 666. Now, you'll find loads of rubbish written on the number 666. In fact, I think it's probably true to say most of what is written is rubbish. Endless writers will tell you that they've worked it out. It's your credit card. It's a barcode. Perhaps it's Barack Obama or the latest American president. Or it's your social security number or an invisible laser tattoo or an injectable passive RFID transponder, whatever that is. Or the UPC, the universal product code. On and on and on go the theories. All devoid of basic principles of biblical interpretation. In the face of a barrage of interpretations like this, don't lose your head. Don't panic. Keep on reading the Bible properly. Keep on using normal Bible interpretation rules. Whenever there's something that we don't understand in the Bible, the rule is simple. It's to let other parts of the Bible interpret this part of the Bible for us. The principle is we always let the clear things teach us the unclear things. We let the things we do understand interpret the things that we don't. Now, the Bible is very clear that there are only two kinds of people in the world. There are those that worship the Lamb and those that worship Satan. There are people that are marked with the promised Holy Spirit and there are people that are marked with the mark of the beast. There are people who have submitted to Jesus as Lord and then there are those they haven't. And so 666 then is not a barcode or a computer chip or a credit card or, or whatever it is that's the latest piece of technology. It's the symbol of who you worship. If you're a Christian today, you are marked by Jesus, sealed with the Holy Spirit, indwelled by Christ. If you're not a disciple of Jesus, then you are marked with 666. It is the symbol of who you worship. Marks are about ownership. They're about belonging. When two sporting sides play off, the spectators mark themselves based on their allegiances. They paint their faces and their bodies and, and they wear uh, jerseys and shirts. And you do the same if you own cattle. You brand them. You mark them as yours. The marking is an indication in this passage of who you worship. So who do you worship? Do you worship God or do you worship the anti-God? That's the cosmic conflict playing out in our world. Many Westerners think that they worship no one at all. They call themselves perhaps agnostic, perhaps atheist. The tragedy is their inability to see that they actually do worship. They worship themselves, which means they worship the dragon, which is exactly what the dragon desires. He, he uses the two beasts to achieve his purposes. The leopard beast is power and authority. He's the beast of rule and dominion and power. He is the one that sets himself up as an alternative ruler to God. Remember that the Roman emperors did just this. I mean, they chose titles for themselves like Augustus, which means the one to be worshipped, or Dominus, which means Lord. Many a government or leader or, 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 or business leader has set themselves up in the place of God. Communism placed itself in the place of God. Apartheid South Africa set itself up as having the right to determine that people were not all equal. Liberal democracies demand allegiance to their agenda when they make pronouncements on the, on the value of unborn life and what marriage should look like. Even in our own country, people worship power. They, they set themselves up as the ones who rule. And the power they offer is, is so alluring and attractive that people transfer their allegiance and their souls to them and to the dragon. Jimi Hendrix sang, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. He's right, but the leopard is loose. Satan is enticing people away from God with the promise, the promise of power. 
Now, now rule and power are, are not the only way that Satan draws people away from God. The second beast is, is also alluring. The second beast looks like a lamb. It's a, it's a copy of Jesus. It's, it's religion and worship and philosophy. And the second beast is sometimes even the church. What a horror it is to realize that the church may actually take you away from God. And there are churches in our city and in our world that do exactly that today. That's what they do, which is why the New Testament is so full of warnings about false teachers. Are you sure that we're not one of them? Are you investigating? Are you checking the Bible out? The, the world is full of false teachings and false religions and false ideologies and, and false churches that will fill your mind with nice stuff that will gently draw you away from the living God. The Korean religious leader Sun Myung Moon was heralded as the Lord of the Second Advent and, and through him, sadly, many are drawn away from God as is the case with the liberal church that says all roads lead to heaven. Many are drawn away from God. Similarly, those that say, if you can just do something, you'll be drawn away from God. R religions are scattered across every continent and they draw people away from God. That's what they do. But the outcome is certain. Remember, the fish is in the boat. The lamb is coming. And so let me close with chapter 14, verse 1 to 3 of Revelation. Then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. And with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of, of a loud thunder. And the voice I heard was like the, the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. Despite the dragon, despite the beasts and the war and the suffering, the outcome is certain. The lamb will overcome. The lamb has triumphed and the lamb is coming. And he brings with him those that have his name written on their foreheads. Those who've chosen him. He brings with him those that are marked with his blood. And they're singing because it's over. It's all over. And they've been redeemed. And all that we need to be in that crowd is to hang on. Is to endure. Is to keep on believing. All we have to do is to wait patiently for the outcome that is certain. He's done it all for us. We mustn't falter when suffering comes our way. We, we mustn't falter when our world doesn't seem to make sense. We, we mustn't falter when rulers are all powerful and they entice people away after the agenda of power and rule. And we mustn't falter when we're tempted to think that this world is, is going to go on forever. We, we mustn't falter when teachers all around us offer us a way that's more comfortable or less painful or that demands less of us. We mustn't falter when our experience of life is a dragon or a beast prowling around us. We mustn't be afraid because the Lamb has won and the Lamb is coming. So keep on waiting patiently. Be faithful. Hang on. Be kind, be gentle, speak of Christ often, fight for holiness, be generous and big-hearted, be repentant, love God, love people, trust Jesus. He's done everything you need and the Lamb is coming soon. Let's pray. Father, in the midst of our pain and our suffering in this world, we thank you that the outcome is absolutely certain. And we pray for ourselves that we might hang on. Thank you that Jesus has done everything that we might be redeemed. And all we have to do is stay with him, stay loving, with, stay loving him for all eternity. Thank you for our time in your word today. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Jeff Gertzen. I'm the senior pastor at St. Stephen's Church and I'd love to get to know you. Why don't you subscribe, click our subscribe button. If you'd like to get to know a little bit more about Jesus, why don't you click on this video on this side. 
or if you'd like to get to know a little bit more about our church, then click on this video over here. Thanks for watching. I look forward to hearing from you.